For millennia, people from different countries, cultures, and backgrounds have found direction and encouragement in the inspired pages of the Bible. In his day, Jesus directed listeners to search the prophecies of Scripture to find Him the only way of salvation. 2,000 years later, as we stand on the brink of eternity, we no less need the purpose and hope God's Word provides. Sacramento Central Church brings you Receiving the Word, timely Bible messages presented by Pastors Chris Buttery and Mike Thompson. Amazing revelations await you in God's Holy Word, the Bible. Jesus followed the divine plan of education. The schools of his time, with their magnifying of things small and their belittling of things great, he did not seek. Notice this. His education was gained directly from the heaven-appointed sources. So Jesus' education was gained from what? Not the schools of the intellectuals, but from heavenly-appointed sources. And there's four things here I'd like us to notice. Take note of these and get on the program yourself because this is all part of the restorative program which if we will engage in it, it will go a long way to God restoring his image in us. You ready? Heaven appointed useful work. Okay, we already discussed that. I'll get back to that in a moment. Useful work, study of the scriptures, study of nature, and the experiences of life. These are God's lesson books, full of instruction to all who bring to them the willing hand and the seeing eye and the understanding heart. Now you might think, uh, Pastor Mike, I thought you were going to kind of come up with some really interesting things here. They sound a little simplistic, don't they? Work? How many of you like work? No, don't, don't answer that. Work? How many of your children like work? Are your grandchildren like work? It's usually a thing that, oh, do I have to? Hey, work is good. But nonetheless, it doesn't sound very exciting. But nonetheless, work, useful work. What was the other? Study of the scriptures. Well, Pastor Mike, I, I already know that. That's, do you have any, anything original, Pastor Mike? Study of the scriptures. Well, what else do we have? Study of nature. Well, that's for little children in Sabbath school, isn't it? You know, you get a table and you put, you put acorns on and a little leaf. And, uh, you know, you put a little, th- especially this time of the year, you put these little things on and you bring the little children up. Study. I used to do it when I was a five-year-old in school. We had a nature table. You know, nature. Hey, does that seem very exciting? You, original? No. But it's from God's school. It's from God's program, right? And the experiences of life. Well, okay. We need to explain that a bit more, don't we? So let me say again, these four things might sound a little simplistic to the surface reader or the surface listener. But let me tell you, they are not. They are very powerful and very far-reaching if seriously employed in the life of any Christian who desires to pursue the experience of his image in me. I need a t-shirt with that. His image in me or his image in you. Well, let's look at useful work. Let's start with that, first of all. In other words, find something useful to do with your time. Okay? And now this implies more, far more than just maybe, you're, maybe you work eight hours a day or 10 hours a day and you just work for it, whatever it is. If you've got a job, it's not sp- just speaking of your regular work. Okay, you work eight hours, sleep eight hours. There's another eight hours there. What are you doing in those eight hours? God wants you to be usefully industrious in those other hours that you have. And here's the thing. We're notorious for engaging in unuseful work. I know we are. I'm as human as you are. But if we will make a point and say, Lord, show me in this other time, apart from my other job, how to engage in useful labor, useful industriousness, whatever that is, show me what's useful. And if you always gravitate and he shows you and you go toward that which is useful, by default, 
you will start getting out of your life the unuseful work and the unuseful things you do. Does that, that's quite logical, isn't it? Does that make sense? This is not rocket science. This is what God has told us, and it, God is a very, very practical God. Can you agree with that? Very practical. Oh, yeah, so we'll naturally, by default, we'll start getting rid of the unuseful work. Oh, I remember. There's useful work to go. And yes, Pastor Fred, that's right. Pastor Fred is the one in charge of Light Sacramento. And in about three weeks from now, we'll let you know, we will have some useful work to do. Really good, useful work. Only takes an hour, an hour and a half. You go around, you just drop tracks on people's doorsteps. Easy. You can run away if you want. You put it there, and you're gone. You don't even have to talk to anybody. But it's, you know, you get the point. There's so many things where you can do useful things. There's people who need a little bit of help sometimes. Somebody you need to call. Somebody you need to write to. Little things like that, it's useful, and you'll never know the difference it might make in somebody's life. Anyway, we could have a whole sermon on that, but I, I think you will get the point. To echo that part of that famous speech by Pastor uh, John F. Kennedy, what did he say? Ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country in like manner. Don't go around saying, Lord, what can other people do for me? Say, Lord, what can I do for other people? If you develop that mentality, you'll have a healthy view of life and you will by, by default go and do what is useful and helpful to other people and not just be thinking about yourself. I did a sermon the other week called, you remember what was it? Me, me, me. Yeah, me, me, me. We don't need me, me, me. Let's make it you, you, you. Okay, now, if we will uh, pursue this mission of, of useful work, useful industriousness, um, it'll do, I put two things down here. Um, and filling our lives with useful, oh, I already mentioned that, by default, we'll get rid of the unuseful word. But another thing as well, it will enable the Holy Spirit to develop within us the priceless virtues, which we read about in education when Adam was given work to do, uh, a lot of other in patriarchs and prophets. It helps us to perhaps develop a level of self-discipline, responsibility, faithfulness, depend dependability, virtues which we may have been generally lacking all through our own lives. We probably have a measure of some, but God wants us to bring those virtues, this self-discipline, responsibility, faithfulness. He wants us to bring them up to par. It's all part of the restorative process of putting his image back in you and I, the fallen sons and daughters of Adam, that we can grow into the similitude of Christ our righteousness. A useful work also ties in with this issue of using to its fullest potential the, the valuable gift of God-given time. Time is a precious thing. In Christ's Object Lessons, um, Oh, you know, I didn't write the page down, but it's in the chapter called The Talents. Just remember that, The Talents. It's in Christ's Object Lessons. Uh, there is, uh, it speaks about the talent of time. And time, you know, unuseful work, useful work, you do it in the, in the area of time, right? So time is very important. It says this, our time belongs to God. It's not, it's not yours to squander. Our time belongs to God. Every moment is his. And we are under the most serious obligation to improve it to his glory. Of no talent he has given will he require a more strict account than of our time. The value of time is beyond computation. Christ regarded every moment as precious when he was here. He did useful work and he regarded time as a vital commodity. He didn't waste it on uselessness. And it thus, and in thus we may, and, and we should regard it as such. You don't need to tell me this. It says life is too short to be trifled away, especially when we've got this valuable time wherein God is trying to work to restore his image. 
We have about a few days of probation in which to prepare for eternity. We have no time to waste, no time to devote to selfish pleasure, no time for the indulgence of sin. It is now that we are to form characters for the future immortal life. Can you say amen to that? Now, that doesn't mean that you can't have some downtime, okay? Jesus said, come aside and rest a while. That, that's fine. Um, don't want to, we've got to live a balanced life. So it doesn't mean you can't have relaxation and recreation, Samara and I. But whatever you do, always ask the question, and this is very simple, so you've heard this before. Whatever you do, whatever you listen to, whatever you look at, whatever it is, always ask yourself, is this useful? Is this compatible, this that I'm looking at, listening to, is this compatible with the principles of God's word? And if it's not, then there's your answer. You should know what to do. Get rid of it and find something useful that you can do that's wholesome and helpful in your R and R periods. Also ask yourself, this that I'm doing, this that I'm listening to, this which I'm looking at, whatever, ask yourself, is it in harmony with the moving of the Holy Spirit in my life. You know, the Holy Spirit convicts you, you should. You know, you feel you should do this good thing or you feel that you should pray. Holy Spirit's talking to us all the time. And by the way, we should always pray and God, ask God, Lord, help me always to discern your voice from the devil's voice because the, the devil is very good at impersonating God's voice. So anything the Holy Spirit you feel is telling you, always make sure it's in harmony with the Word of God. Don't want to get sidetracked, but always do that. You will be safe then, because you will always then be able to differentiate God's voice from the voice of the impersonator. If the devil is impersonating God's voice a thousand times, you hear these voices all around you, and you think, which is God's? If you are guided by his word, you will know the voice of God. Through above those, one th those 999 voices you hear, you'll be able to say, that is God's voice. I'd know it anyway, and you will always be safe. Okay, so always ask yourself, this that I'm doing, looking at, listening to, is it in harmony with the moving of God's spirit? Does it disturb my conscience? Do, do I find that it kind of appeals to the carnal desires of my fallen flesh. Well, I've fallen flesh till Jesus comes and those urges will come up. But the thing is, through Christ, we don't have to, we don't have to submit to them. But if you willingly open the door and say, up you come, take your share of me, they will be there in a moment. So when you sense these warning signs, you feel that's telling you plain and simple, according to God's program of education and rehabilitation, shut it off, Turn it off, walk away from it, go find something else useful to do in the way of relaxation. Philippians 4.8, very simple here, a rule of thumb. Philippians 4.8, finally, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, that means righteous, does that? Whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, what? Think on these things. Look on these things. Listen to these things. And you'll get an A in your homework. Okay. Second point, study of Scripture. 1 Peter 1.23 says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. We could have a whole sermon, right, on the word of God. And we should know a lot of these things. We know that Jesus, you know, the word of God was his sword. Oh, those three temptations, he was there and sheathed that sword to the devil. It is written, it is written, it is written. Get thou behind me, Satan. So we need that. But there's another thing, too, about reading Scripture, not hurriedly, but when you open the Word of God and you immerse your mind in it, the sanctifying power of God's Word will work in the mind and in the heart and the character. And it's this, too, that we must get from, not just looking for proof text to prove which is the Sabbath in an argument. You can do that very successfully, but you can do it with a carnal mind. You know, I'm on about what the Word of God will do 
to restore the image of God in us. Education, page 126, it's a great book. The creative energy that called the worlds into existence is the Word of God, is in the Word of God. Sorry, did you get that? The creative energy that called the worlds into existence is in the Word of God. This Word imparts power. It begets life. Every command is a promise. Accepted by the will, received into the soul, it brings with it the life of the infinite one. Jesus, it brings his life into your life. It transforms the nature, and listen to this. I didn't know it said this till I went looking. I came to my mind, I went looking for this, and I, I read it, and right at the end, that's the very theme that we've got. It transforms the nature and recreates the soul in the, guess what? The image of who? God, that's right. It transforms the nature and recreates the soul into the image of God. Study of, the, study of nature, well, as I said, it's not just for children. Adam was taught some very powerful lessons in nature. Uh, when the first leaves started falling off the trees and the flowers wilted, it was a lesson to him that came before his eyes every fall, every season, for all those hundreds of years he lived. Death. And he realized it was a lesson book that taught him right from nature this hard lesson about sin. But it also taught him another lesson in the spring. You know, when the flowers started coming up again, there was this message he taught him about God's mercy and his grace and his love. You know the kind of thing I, I, I'm talking about. Um, what was I going to say? I had a thought there. Yeah, even as Christians... Um, we have gotten far removed from contemplating uh, nature. It, we speak of it as the second book. You've got the Bible, as God's revealed well, but then you've got nature. We speak of nature as, as God's second book. You see his creative works. But because of sin, we need the Bible to interpret sometimes the things we see in nature. We see animals killing one another. Well, how did that get here? Well, the Bible explains why. So, but still, it's the second book, is nature, and it's full of many, many lessons. It's a treasure trove that is sadly neglected by so many of, of us, especially Seventh-day Adventists. Because if you want to put it another way, the study of nature is a study of creationism. And we are sitting here this morning because of what reason? Because there is a God in heaven? Yes, he created... Ah, oh, I already gave you the answer. What did he do? He created us. And he gave us this day, the seventh day Sabbath, to remind us in six days he made heaven and earth and the sea, all that in them is. And on the seventh day he rested. So as seventh-day Adventists, we should be ones who are big on studying the book of nature. Again, if you've got little kids, take them out. If you've got grandchildren, take them out. Again, it's a treasure trove that we've neglected. We're so, our minds are so distracted by artificial stimuli that we don't take time to go out and just be still and just be quiet. Jesus would get up early in the morning, go out to some secluded place. Now, true, there wasn't big, sprawling suburbia in those days, but nonetheless, that's still the principle. So we need, uh, this little bit I'll conclude here, speaking about God's creativeness, which, which helps us to understand who he is, keeps us constantly in, in, in memory of the fact he made us. Uh, here is um, a DVD. I bought several the other week. And it's called, it's Genesis History. It's a play on words. And it's produced by an organization. Um, um, well, actually, you can go online. It's genesishistory.com. And this one here, there's, there's three discs in here. I've got another three or four cases with stuff in. And this is excellent. This is the kind of stuff some of the Adventists should be producing. But sadly, we're not. It takes you, and it takes you to uh, where, Saint where Mount St. Helens blew up, and it shows you the rock strata. And it says there, if you took an evolutionist blindfolded and uh, take the blindfold off and then tell them, ask them, where are you? They say, well, I'm in some canyon, and, and how old are these layers? Well, this layer is four million years old. This is six million years old. It looks just like 
the sediment, sediment, sedimentary layers of the Grand Canyon, but on a smaller scale. But yet all that stuff was created and put there in a matter of weeks. Because when Mount St. Helens blew its top, I think it said there was, oh, 30 or 40 feet of, uh, of all this sediment laid down very quickly. And then a lot of slurry came down, so it gouged out these channels, just like little Grand Canyons, gouged them all out. And you go there now, and you, you, you'd look if you didn't know, you said, oh, this, is, this is millions of years old. It happened in a few days. It's just incredible. And this is brought to light on, on, this, on, on this one here. So you can find stuff online, isgenesishistory.com. All right, I have to move on. The, dis the, the discipline of life, the trials of life, the experiences of life. You know, we, we, if we can't learn from experiences of life, then we're in a bad way. If you do something, you make a success of something, then learn from that to do it better the next time. So where you succeed, do it better. If you fail, learn a lesson from that and figure out how you can get it right next time. So we have to learn from the experiences of life and going through certain experiences of life is part of God's curriculum for each one of us. Jesus went through it. David went through it. Adam went through it. We all go through it. And when you go through certain experiences that God puts you through, he does it for a purpose. So when you've committed your life to God, you will know that all things work truly together for good. And you realize that though you don't see his face at this time of trial, you're down in a dark valley, he's still there and he's growing your faith. It all works together for good. I've got to move quick, but let me read you this from Ministry of Healing, page 470 and 471. Um, <clears throat> It says, uh, we pray for a Christ-likeness of character and suddenly we find ourselves placed in circumstances that call forth all the evil of our natures. Lord, I prayed for patience. I prayed to be good. And now what's gone wrong here? All this evil's coming out of me. It says, faults are revealed of which we did not even suspect the existence. Like Israel of all, they question, if God is leading us, why, all the, why do all these things come upon us? And it says on the next page, 471, in his providence, God brings these persons into different positions and varied circumstances that may, they may discover in their character the defects which have been concealed from their own knowledge. He gives them opportunity to correct these defects and to fit themselves for his service. Often he permits the fires of affliction to assail them that they might be purified. And such purification all plays its part in restoring in us the image of God. You know, soon I'm going to, I've got to cut this short, soon our earthly sojourn will be over. And when it's all done, we will have one of two images. We'll either have the image of evil or we will have the image of God. And whichever one you have, you've got it. It's irreplaceable, it's irreversible, and um, this is why life is a very, very serious thing. But you know, we have grace, which we've been speaking about. And God is on your side. He wants to do in you a work which at this moment in your life experience you can't even dream of, how glorious it will be if you will let him. It says in Great Controversy, page 648, that when Adam gets to the kingdom of glory, he'll see his savior, and Jesus will throw his arms around him in spite of his great failure. And it says on page 648, the savior leads him to the tree of life, and plucks the glorious fruit and bids him eat. Is that wonderful? Jesus longs for the time when he can pick that same fruit for you and bid you eat. No matter how fallen you are, no matter how wayward you are, no matter how obliterated his image might not be seen in you today, there's nothing he cannot do. 
And you might bow your head and quietly say, oh, Pastor Mike, how I wish that Jesus would pluck that fruit for me and put it in my hand and bid me eat. Well, you can turn away from such a forlorn uh, wish and know with absolute certainty that he can do for you what nobody else and nothing else can. He will restore you. He will forgive you. And he will do a work in you if you will allow him to put you through the school of finding useful work, useful things. Making his word not just an information book, but one that you feed on and it changes you. And nature. And what was the last one? Life experience. Yeah. It all works for good and you will see his hands at work in your life. So if you may have been one of those people who pushed him off, I don't want it, but you want it now. And you think of all the times those nail-scarred hands have reached out and just longed to mold you and shape you and restore in you your image, his image. And you think, all those times I pushed those hands away, those hands are still there, just waiting to say, Lord, begin it. Do your work. I'm ready. And through your grace, I can be all that you want me to be. I conclude with this verse from Matthew chapter 13. Verse 43, Matthew 13, verse 43. It says this. Jesus is speaking of the saved. He says, Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who has ears to hear, let him hear. You can one day shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of your heavenly Father. You can shine forth with that image restored where the glory shines from you. If first down here you will let, you'll shine like the sun, but if you let the sun, S-O-N, shine first within you, he'll take care of the rest. So may God bless you. May God be with you. And may you allow him and all of us together to do his work in us. And one day it'll all be over. And we'll say praise God for his greatness, his goodness, and his love. Do we serve a good God? You say amen. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. We're so glad you decided to tune in to today's Receiving the Word program. If you have a special prayer request, we would be happy to pray about it for you. To discover more about the Bible through our free online Bible studies or to listen to more life-changing Bible messages, go to saccentral.org and click on the Media Resources tab. If you've been blessed or encouraged by our ministry and God impresses you to support us, then visit our website or write to us at 6045 Camellia Avenue, Sacramento, California, 95819. Always gladly receive God's Word.